Sound like you might. Okay, so welcome to the first colloquium of the semester. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of our own. This is Professor Janelle Walsh, who, uh, let's give a quick bio in case people don't know you. So Janelle finished her doctoral work at the University of California, Irvine, starting her work on something called supermassive black holes and weighing and characterizing them. She then received a very prestigious postdoctoral fellowship from the NSF. It was one of the, the NSF, um, uh, I forgot the actual name, but it's the fellowship they offer with the, I should know, the Astronomy Astrophysics Fellowship, which she had at the University of the other Texas University in Austin. Prior to coming here, joining us as I think one of our first Mitchell Institute of Astronomy Fellows, and then we were smart enough to hire her onto our faculty where she's been pursuing research to measure and characterize the masses and properties of black holes and the centers of galaxies and how they interact with their host galaxies. Uh, so today she'll be telling us all about that work. Thank you very much, Janelle. Um, if we have questions on the chat, should I try to interrupt you or? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so if people have questions, we'll take some interruptions. Otherwise, you know, it's welcome, Janelle. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm going to, oh, Joanne, should I mean, if you, can you guys see everything okay? Okay, it's fine to leave on. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about black holes and in particular supermassive black holes and the connections to the galaxies that they reside in. Uh, so hopefully I can convince you all that this is an interesting field uh, with obviously still a lot left to be learned. So I'm actually going to start with the first discoveries of black holes, uh, although initially they were not identified as that. Uh, so about 60 years ago, Martin Schmidt examined 3C273 and found that although this object looked like a star, uh, so it was point-like and compact and very bright, it's actually quite far away from us. Uh, so it's at a distance of 750 megaparsecs or 2.4 billion light years. Uh, so a parsec corresponds to a few light years. Um, so this is a modern day image of 3C273 taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that there's a whole lot of light coming from a small region. Now, if you carefully subtract off that point source, you're left with this fuzzy blob, and that's actually the underlying host galaxy. So 3C273 belongs to this class of objects we now call quasars, which are so bright that it can actually outshine the galaxies they reside in. So we now know that this tremendous amount of light we're seeing is due to the accretion of material onto a black hole, and in this case, a very massive black hole uh, with a mass of 9 times 10 to the 8 solar masses. So as material is falling onto the black hole, it's reaching very high speeds and heats up and therefore becomes very luminous. So around the same time, X-ray binaries were also being discovered, which is a phenomenon we now know requires the presence of some compact object like a black hole. So Cygnus X1 is a very famous example. This is a very bright X-ray source located in our own galaxy. So Cygnus X1 is actually a 15 solar mass black hole that's being orbited by a companion star. And so just like with that previous example, it's this accretion of material, in this case, from the companion star onto the black hole that's producing the very energetic and strong X-rays. So as you can see with these two examples, Cygnus X1 and 3C273, black holes actually come in a wide range of masses. So black holes can be as small as a few times the mass of the sun. Uh, these are stellar mass black holes, and they form when massive stars run out of their nuclear fuel. Uh, so we think stellar mass black holes are scattered throughout galaxies and in pretty large numbers sometimes. Uh, in contrast, uh, supermassive black holes weigh a million or more solar masses, and they reside at the centers of galaxies. Exactly how supermassive black holes form uh, is still unknown. Um, one of the theoretical scenarios, though, is that the death of the first generation of stars in the universe could have produced the first black holes, perhaps with initial masses of about 100 solar masses, and then through the accretion of material and the merging of galaxies, those black holes could have grown into the supermassive black holes of today. So now you might be wondering, what about in between, right? So is there something out there that weighs, say, a thousand times the mass of the sun? Uh, and we think so, uh, but with the current observational facilities, it's really difficult to very clearly detect the presence of these so-called intermediate mass black holes. Um, so for now, there's the possibility that they exist in very low mass galaxies uh, with masses less than the Milky Way, or perhaps in clusters of stars associated with the galaxy. Um, so I'm interested in the most massive black holes in the universe, and I'm only going to be focusing on supermassive black holes. 
Okay, so we now, it's now widely accepted that supermassive black holes reside at the centers of essentially every massive galaxy. And we now have very strong evidence for the presence of supermassive black holes. So that includes the accretion signatures, like I was describing for 3C273, uh, but also very impressive images of black hole shadow in objects like M87 and in our own galaxy. Now the best dynamical evidence we have comes from our own galaxy, where we can track the paths of individual stars as they orbit very close to the black hole. So from those stellar orbits, we know how much mass is enclosed, and that turns out to be 4 million solar masses. Furthermore, given how close some of these stars get to the center of the galaxy without being ripped apart, that places a maximum radius on that central dark object. So only a black hole is dense enough to contain so much mass within the small space we see here. Now, beyond the Milky Way, though, black holes have been dynamically detected in about 100 galaxies to date. Dynamically searching for black holes requires very high angular resolution observations that probe the innermost regions of galaxies where the gravitational potential from the black hole dominates. So that region is known as the black hole sphere of influence. Uh, so this is different than the short tailed radius, you know, that point of no return around a black hole. Um, the black hole sphere of influence is actually larger than the short shield radius, uh, but its size is still pretty small. Uh, so for example, a typical supermassive black hole with 10 to the eight solar masses would have a black hole sphere of influence that's roughly tens of parsecs. Therefore, resolving such small scales with the current observational facilities really limits our measurement of black holes to those that are nearby, roughly within 100 megaparsecs. And so the Hubble Space Telescope, with its great angular resolution, has therefore played a fundamental role in detecting black holes uh, over the past 25 years. So from such observations, we've learned that the masses of black holes correlate with the large scale properties of the host galaxy. Uh, so more massive black holes are found in more massive galaxies, where roughly speaking, we see that the mass of the black hole is about 0.1% of the host galaxy's bulge mass. Um, so a bulge is this central concentration of stars. Uh, in a galaxy like this one, kind of that spherical distribution of light would be the bulge, whereas in a galaxy like this one, an elliptical galaxy, the entire galaxy is considered to be a bulge. Um, but I really do want to emphasize that these bulges extend far away from the black hole and are well outside the black hole sphere of influence. So it is really surprising to see that the masses of black holes correlate with these very large scale bulge properties. And so this implies that somehow black holes and galaxies grow in tandem. Um, so a number of correlations have been found over the years uh, between black hole masses and various galaxy properties. Here are kind of two of the more well-studied relations between the black hole mass and the bulge luminosity, or ML, and then the black hole mass and stellar velocity dispersion, or M sigma. So you can think of the stellar velocity dispersion as a measure of the random motions of stars in a galaxy. So despite the growing number of black hole mass measurements, the local black hole mass census is highly incomplete. And this is particularly true for low mass black holes, below about a few times 10 to the seven solar masses, and then for high mass black holes above about a few times 10 to the nine solar masses. So this leaves major questions regarding the distribution of black hole masses with host galaxy properties. Um, and with the present measurements, things like the slope, intrinsic scatter, even the shape of the correlations for low and high mass black holes are not well established. Uh, in fact, the M sigma and ML relationships actually make very different predictions for the most luminous and the highest dispersion galaxies and it's not clear how to reconcile that difference. Also, these relationships aren't as simple as one slot, and there are hints that these relationships may not apply consistently to all kinds of galaxies. So obviously, there's still a lot left to be learned about how black holes are connected to galaxies. Uh, we really don't have a good understanding of the primary physical mechanisms that drive those empirical correlations I was showing. And as a result, we don't really understand the exact role black holes play in galaxy evolution. There's plenty of other open questions too. As some examples, do black holes in galaxies uh, grow in lockstep with one another over time, or does the growth of black hole precede that of the host galaxy or vice versa? You know, are there black holes in these low mass galaxies and in clusters of stars associated with galaxies? How do supermassive black holes form? You know, how can they get so much mass so quickly after the Big Bang? 
So in order to address some of those questions, and in particular, how black holes and galaxies grow together, what we really need are more black hole mass measurements, especially at the extremes of the black hole mass scale, and over a wider range of galaxies that have grown in different ways. So with the rest of the talk, I'll be highlighting several projects that are aimed at taking those necessary steps, and then also talking about both the observational and modeling advances that have made them possible. And of course, none of this work would be able to be done without the current and former uh, grad students and postdocs that are here. Okay, so as I mentioned before, HST uh, has played this fundamental role in detecting black holes you know, over the past two decades. But more recently, significant progress has been made using adaptive optics, AO, on large ground-based telescopes. So AO corrects for distortions due to the Earth's constantly changing atmosphere. Um, so when observing from the ground, even with a large telescope, without adaptive optics, the stars appear blurry. But when you turn the AO system on, you're going to see that the stars become much more sharp, right? So using AO is basically like putting on really fancy eyeglasses. So AO on large ground-based telescopes can actually deliver similar angular resolutions as HST, but it has the added advantage of being used with larger telescopes, and it operates in the near infrared. So all of that means that galaxies that were previously really tough to observe with HST because they were too faint or perhaps a little too dusty can instead be studied in great detail with AO on large telescopes. Also, AO is often used in conjunction with integral field units or IFUs, and IFUs allow us to obtain very efficiently hundreds or thousands of spectra all at once across an object. Now, the approach that has been used for years is to measure one or a few black holes at a time, given the extensive observational and modeling efforts that are needed just for a single determination. But something we also need to do to advance the field is to study larger homogeneous data sets of carefully selected samples. And so that's one thing that we are trying to do. And we're doing this with the eight meter Gemini North Telescope in Hawaii. So we have 253 hours to measure black hole masses using stellar dynamical modeling methods in 31 galaxies using the IFU NIFS assisted by AO. So the goal of this program is to obtain a more complete census of local black holes in a wider range of galaxies. So here I'm showing a plot of the galaxy luminosity in the near infrared, and then the effective radius, which is just a characteristic size for a galaxy. So all of these green dots here are showing the current published dynamical black hole mass measurements. And then for comparison, these gray contours are showing the nearby galaxy population. So the point here is that the current dynamical black hole mass measurements have been made in a set of galaxies that are not representative of the local galaxy population. So at a given luminosity, galaxies with small sizes relative to the nearby population are the ones that have been preferentially targeted. They turn out to be the easiest to observe and model. But it's really important to properly sample this luminosity or equivalently mass size parameter space. So as you move away in this direction, a whole bunch of galaxy properties change. Things like the stellar velocity aspersions, the stellar populations, the gas content, the bulge fractions, and morphology. Also, galaxies that grow in different ways end up on different regions of this plot. So clearly, we need to do a better job of sampling this important parameter space if we wanna get at what the true distribution of black hole masses are with host galaxy properties. So here in red is our sample. Um, so our sample significantly increases coverage of this important parameter space without sampling that already well-populated region within this dotted oval. So the galaxies in our sample span a wide range of properties by design. Uh, for example, the stellar velocity aspersions range from 60 to 300 kilometers per second. We also have a number of spiral galaxies in our sample. We'll nearly double the number of black hole mass measurements that have been made in spiral galaxies, which is a regime that largely has not been tackled with stellar dynamical modeling techniques. So, so far we have completed observations with NIFS for 12 galaxies, and those 12 galaxies already significantly enhance the diversity of black hole hosts. So we've observed the largest, most luminous galaxy in our sample, and then lower luminosity galaxies at different effective radii. Um, and so here are just some example spectra from NIFS uh, located at the nucleus and then about an arc second away for the most recent six galaxies we finished observing. Um, and the data quality here really are excellent. 
Now, unlike the galactic center or these external galaxies, we can't make out the motions of individual stars. But from the absorption lines, what we can do is measure the velocity distribution of all the stars along our line of sight. And we measure that distribution as a function of spatial location because we have an IFU. Uh, so we characterize that distribution by its center, the velocity, the spread, the velocity dispersion, and then asymmetric and symmetric deviations from a Gaussian. So that would be uh, this H3 and H4. Um, so these are just some example kinematic maps uh, for two galaxies in the sample. So the kinematic values are shown with different colors given by the scale bar, and then the minimum and maximum values are to the top of the maps. So these velocity maps show that both of these galaxies are rotating, right? So we have one side of the galaxy that's red shifted, the other side of the galaxy that's blue shifted. So that corresponds to rotation. Um, we also see the sharp rise in the velocity dispersion at the center, reaching values of about 375 and about 60 kilometers per second. Uh, so again, you can see that we have a wide range of galaxies in our sample. Uh, we also have some interesting cases. Uh, so this is NGC 4111. Um, and here we actually see a drop in the velocity dispersion at the center. So that could be an indication of a non-detection of a black hole, uh, which would still be interesting because that would suggest that this galaxy lies well below both the current M sigma and ML relations. Now the sigma drop could also result from a distinct dynamically cold component of stars at the nucleus too. Uh, so our dynamical models will be able to distinguish between those scenarios. Uh, we also now have completed HST imaging in all three filters for all 31 galaxies. And we've observed all of the galaxies with uh, wide field IFUs like LRS2 on the Hobby Ebeling telescope, uh, as well as even wider field IFUs, Virus P and Virus W on the 2.7 meter telescope at McDonald's. So we then construct these orbit-based stellar dynamical models. So how this works is that uh, gravitational potential uh, has a contribution from the black hole, stars, and dark matter. So that stellar potential is determined by taking that HST image and deprojecting it, assuming a viewing orientation, and then multiplying by a parameter that converts the light we see into a mass. So that's the mass to light ratio. Uh, we then integrate orbits in that potential and we assign weights to the orbits such that the superposition reproduces the brightness from our image as well as the kinematics from our spectroscopy. And then we just repeat, we calculate a whole bunch of different models, varying the parameters of interest, looking for the one that most closely matches the data. So here's an example of, again, one of the galaxies. This is PGC12557 again. Um, so these are contours of chi squared as a function of black hole mass and mass to light ratio. So we're finding a black hole mass of 2.3 times 10 to the nine solar masses. Now, uh, oh, also I should say, over here uh, are just the comparison between our observations from NIST and LRS2 in black here, and then our spit model in green. So we actually used four independent orbit-based modeling codes that our team has access to uh, in order to study this galaxy here. So all of these codes you know, follow the same general approach that I just described, uh, but the details of how certain things are implemented are different. Uh, and so that gives us also a way to get a handle on our uh, uncertainties and possible systematic effects. Oh, I should say they all produce the same black hole mass. <laughs> that was very important. <laughs> okay, so uh, PGC12557 uh, is actually consistent with M sigma, but ends up being this positive outlier from ML. Um, and this is similar to a few other galaxies that have prior measurements in the literature. Um, so these are now shown in red. Again, they're offset from ML. Um, so all of these galaxies are very similar to each other. They happen to all be early type galaxies. Uh, so what I mean by that is they're either elliptical galaxies or what we call S0 galaxies that have both a bulge and a disk component. Uh, but all of these early type galaxies are compact. In other words, they have small sizes with effective radii of one to three kiloparsecs for their large luminosities of about 10 to 11 solar luminosities in the near infrared, and they have these large stellar, stellar velocity dispersions. Um, so all four of these galaxies host these high mass black holes, but they are very different from the kinds of galaxies you would actually expect to find at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. So uh, here as an example, I'm showing some of the galaxies in the Perseus cluster. NGC 1275 
is the brightest galaxy the cluster? And this is exactly the kind of galaxy you would expect to find at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. So these kind of galaxies are large in size, typically with effective radii of like 10 kiloparsecs or more. And they're often these dispersion supported galaxies showing little to no rotation. In contrast, the local compact galaxies like NGC 1277 and PGC 12557 look like this. So they are small and flattened. And they turn out to be rapidly rotating. So these local compact galaxies don't look like the typical massive early type galaxies. Instead, they actually look quite similar to the typical massive galaxies at an earlier epoch in the universe at a redshift of two, the so-called red nuggets. So since the compact galaxies look very similar to the redshift two red nuggets, they could be relics. The redshift two red nuggets are thought to grow in size and a little bit in mass through a series of mergers to produce the typical massive early type galaxies of today. But these local compact galaxies appear to have taken a different evolutionary pathway, a more passive one in which they didn't experience those same amount of mergers to build up the outskirts of their galaxies. If true, then these local compact galaxies, given their overmassive black holes, could reflect a previous time when the local ML relationship did not apply all galaxies contained over massive black holes, and it was the growth of the host galaxy that had yet to catch up. In other words, it could suggest that black hole growth comes before galaxy growth. There is another possibility, and I should definitely mention it. Uh, so another possibility is that we simply don't have enough mass measurements at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. So neither the form of the correlations nor the intrinsic scatter of the correlations is well established in this high mass regime. So these compact galaxies could just be very weird. Uh, they could kind of fall in the tails of a distribution between black hole masses and galaxy properties uh, that have yet to really be established. Okay, so that was an example of a stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement from the Gemini Large Program. And the Large Program was designed to make those kind of measurements. Uh, however, in some of our galaxies, we see prominent near infrared emission lines in the NIFS data. And so one such example is NGC 4111, and I briefly mentioned this galaxy before. Uh, so this galaxy is an early type galaxy. Again, it's nearby, it's edge on, and it has this dusty polar ring that you can see in the HST image. Um, so with the NIFS data, we see that there's warm molecular gas, H2, um, in this galaxy, and it's embedded in that dusty polar ring. There's also previously published stellar kinematics and then also ionized oxygen-3 gas kinematics uh, from the IFU CERON that was published as part of the Atlas 3D survey. So our NIST data are probing the innermost regions out to about 100 parsecs, and then the CERON data are probing larger spatial scales out to about 1.5 kiloparsecs. Um, so you've already seen this series of maps before. Uh, so this is the small scale stellar kinematics measured from NIFS. Uh, so again, the galaxy is rotating here. And then there's that velocity dispersion drop at the center. Now, the large scale stellar kinematics from CERON also show similar features. Um, so now the small scale data, uh, the warm molecular gas H2 from NIFS, though, shows something different. Um, so this is a map of the flux. And what we're seeing in this distribution is that this is the bright side uh, to the northwest, which we take to be the near side. Um, and so this near side of the gas distribution is red shifted, right? And then the far side over here is blue shifted. And so that suggests inflow. Um, over here are the larger scale ionized uh, gas kinematics. And we see something different again. So this is more of a complex map where there seems to be some kind of twist in it. And any kind of position angle that you might draw here doesn't coincide with any principal axis for NGC 4111, uh, not with the photometric axis or you know, a major axis that you would draw from the stars. So this gas is in an unstable configuration. Um, so we kind of uh, put more effort into studying this more complex uh, ionized gas velocity field from CERON. Um, and we found it was actually the superposition of two components, one that's rotating in the main plane of the galaxy, and then one that's rotating in the dusty polar ring. So when you add these two components together, you get this more complex looking velocity map, uh, but there are residuals. And so these residuals here represent the non-circular motions of this ionized gas 
within the dusty polar ring. And so there seems to be hints of a possible spiral-like spiral structure that also hints at inflow and possibly connecting to this small scale warm molecular gas from NIFS. Uh, so with this analysis, we propose that this dusty polar ring is from the capture of a dwarf galaxy by NGC 4111. The CERN ionized gas is really the superposition of two components, one that's rotating in the galaxy plane and one that's rotating in that dusty polar ring. The residual non-circular motion um, has this spiral-like structure that connects to the small scale warm ionized gas, warm molecular gas. And then that NIFS H2 gas shows inflow with the near side being red shifted and the far side being blue shifted. Now, some of that gas may be settling into the galaxy plane and forming new stars. And that would cause the observed stellar velocity dispersion drop at the center that we see. Um, and at least some of the gas though seems to be reaching the nucleus, triggering a low luminosity active galactic nucleus or AGN. And this AGN uh, is still though kind of in this dusty environment. Uh, so maybe it was only recently triggered. Okay, so AO on large telescopes has certainly made an impact. In addition, we now have these wide field, highly sensitive IFUs like MUSE on the Very Large Telescope in Chile, that's an eight meter telescope, um, and the KCWI, which is on the 10 meter Keck telescope in Hawaii. So with these instruments, they provide us with a way to very efficiently hunt for the most massive black holes in the universe. So detecting such large black holes is difficult because they're rare, so you have to search for them over larger distances, and because they tend to be found in the most massive galaxies, which often show, show these surface brightness cores. Uh, so what I mean by that, you can see in this figure here, so the lower mass elliptical galaxies tend to have these rising light profiles, like you're seeing with the gray lines, but the much more massive ellipticals tend to have a deficit of light at the center, like what you're seeing with those red lines. So it's really challenging to obtain the high signal to noise observations needed to measure reliably the stellar kinematics in these very faint galaxy centers. So the central cores of these massive ellipticals are thought to result from the gravitational scouring of binary black holes, where stars passing close to the binary get scattered out to larger radii. As a result, you might expect to see a correlation between the black hole mass and the core size, and there have been some hints of this kind of relation. Uh, so we are targeting uh, elliptical galaxies with very large diffuse stellar cores um, with KCWI. Uh, so, so far we have observations of five galaxies and they have core sizes that range from one and a half to four and a half kiloparsecs. Uh, so that means they are actually off this plot here. Um, and so given that these galaxies could host 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes. And to date, there has only been two black holes that have been detected with such large masses. Um, so the galaxies that we are studying, again, have these very faint cores they are much fainter than the cores of the other massive ellipticals that host the known most massive black holes. So really this work is only possible because of the very sensitive uh, IFU KCWI on CAC. Um, so even just with two and a half hours on source uh, with a certain configuration, it's the small slicer of KCWI. And then I think we spent about six hours with the large slicer and did multiple pointings to get a wider field. But even with that amount of time, we're able to get very high signal to noise data, both at the nucleus and then on larger spatial scales. Um, so here's some example spectra at different spatial locations. So you can see it is very high signal to noise. Um, and then these are maps of the velocity and velocity aspersion for two different galaxies. Um, and so we're seeing just this very low amplitude rotation um, and then this rise in the velocity aspersion of the center. And then to give you a sense of the wide field coverage we have, um, this is the velocity map for one of the galaxies taken uh, at multiple pointings with the large slicer. So initial stellar dynamical models for these galaxies are suggesting two to four times 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes in these galaxies. Um, also, uh, with these stellar dynamical models, they're a quite powerful tool. So besides measuring the black hole masses, we get the stellar orbital distribution. And so we can do things like test core formation scenarios and infer galaxy assembly histories. 
Okay, so besides those observational advances, AO and large telescopes, highly sensitive IFUs on Keck, there have also been improvements on the modeling side. Um, so there's been work to constrain uh, the stellar dynamical models, not just like with the observed stellar kinematics, but also trying to fold in stellar population information like ages and metallicities. There's also been the development of new codes that allow for the intrinsic shape of the galaxy to be triaxial. Uh, so that's where you have a long intermediate and short axis. So that's different than the uh, simpler case where you're assuming axis symmetry, where you have a long axis and the two other axes are the same. Uh, there's also been substantial effort put into testing and enhancing an already existing triaxial code. Um, so in addition to speeding it up and improving the orbital sampling, we're also looking into implementing a new parameter search strategy. So I just wanna explain that last point a little bit more. Um, so with these uh, orbit-based stellar dynamical models, uh, they are very computationally intensive. So we are integrating typically a million orbits for one model, and that can take 24 hours to do. But that is just for one gravitational potential. And we need to sample many, many different potentials. Um, so for example, nearly all stellar dynamical black hole mass measurements to date have been attained assuming axis symmetry, and those models typically have four free parameters. But when relaxing that assumption, moving to triaxial models, you now can have seven free parameters. So in the past, axisymmetric models were optimized using a grid search, uh, but that's no longer feasible with these triaxial models. So uh, even for just a single coarse grid search where you have 10 values along each axis, that means you're integrating a million orbits for each of the 10 to the seven models. So that is just not possible. Um, so we've been exploring new ways to search this high dimensional parameter space, uh, basically finding ways to have a more representative sampling of this high dimensional space uh, where we can get away with doing much less uh, models um, over, even though we, you know, we're going to say six or seven parameters. Um, and this will definitely have an impact on both the low and high mass end of the relations. So being able to explore triaxiality is important for modeling bars, which we often find in low mass spiral galaxies. And they're also important for modeling high mass galaxies, uh, a majority of which we think are actually mildly triaxial. Um, so as an example of our work, I want to highlight one galaxy, uh, NGC 2693, that we analyzed as part of the Massive survey. So just a quick detour to tell you a little bit about Massive. Um, so this is an IFU and photometric survey um, of all the early type galaxies in the northern sky with stellar masses above 10 to the 11.5 solar masses. Um, and so we're learning about the dark matter halos, the stellar populations, and the black holes in these about 100 most massive galaxies within 100 megaparsecs. Um, so we've involved a number of graduate students, and then there has been these offshoots from the main program. Okay, so getting back to NGC 2693, uh, this is an elliptical galaxy at a distance of 91 megaparsecs. We have this HST near infrared imaging, we also have measurements of the large scale stellar kinematics out to about two and a half effective radii. Um, and that was done with the IFU virus P on the 2.7 meter telescope at McDonald's. And then we also have uh, measurements of the central stellar kinematics uh, with the IFU, at least in the IFU mode, uh, Gemini GMOS. Um, and that was taken under excellent seeing conditions. So we fit both axisymmetric and triaxial stellar dynamical models to this galaxy. For the axisymmetric case, uh, we examined two approaches, one that involves solving the genes equations, which is known as JAM, and then one that uses that orbit-based approach that I have been describing. Um, and so these are showing the 1D and 2D posteriors when you fit uh, with JAM. Um, and this is just the comparison between the observations in, let's see, green and red, and the best fit model are the black open squares. So the observed kinematics are highly inconsistent with the predicted kinematics if you don't include a black hole in the model. Now for the triaxial orbit-based modeling, we use six parameters to describe the black hole, the stars, the dark matter halo, and the viewing orientation. And we were, very, we were able to very efficiently sample this high dimensional parameter space and use about an order of magnitude fewer points than we think we would have needed if we had done a grid search. 
So we find a black hole mass of 1.7 times 10 to the nine solar masses. And it does matter whether you assume that this galaxy is axisymmetric or triaxial. Um, so when we fit it with our axisymmetric models, the black hole mass changes by about 40% and then about 70%. Also, we find that this galaxy is mildly triaxial and our triaxial models are able to fit the observed non-axisymmetric features that are seen in the data. So NGC 2693 hosts a high mass black hole. When we relax the assumption of axisymmetry, that changes the black hole mass by 40 to 70%. Uh, NGC 2693 is um, this elliptical galaxy that's rotating pretty quickly. And such galaxies are often assumed to be axisymmetric, but our work shows that even these so-called fast rotators can be mildly triaxial. Uh, so NGC 2693 is one of only five galaxies to have been modeled in this way. Uh, so it's definitely crucial to apply this modeling now that we have it to a larger sample, even the galaxies that we often assume to be axisymmetric. Um, and so going forward, we will be doing that. We'll be running axisymmetric and triaxial uh, stellar dynamical models for other galaxies and massive. This, of course, will also impact our work that I was discussing before for these massive galaxies with these large diffuse stellar cores that we have KCWI observations of. Okay, so, so far I've been talking about results from stellar dynamical models. One of the other main ways to measure a black hole mass is to model the rotation of nuclear gas disks. So up until a few years ago, nearly all gas dynamical black hole mass measurements were made using ionized gas from HST observations. But molecular gas from radio observations offers an attractive alternative. So uh, one of the main assumptions with gas dynamical modeling is that the gas participates in circular rotation in a thin disk. Um, and the molecular gas, it's very cold and dense. And so it's um, is more amenable to that kind of assumption. Uh, so we often find that these molecular gas disks exhibit less turbulent motion compared to the warmer ionized gas disks. Also the data cubes we get from radio observations give us more complete coverage of these gas disks. Uh, and that's especially true compared to just the handful of spectra that we used to get from you know, these few HST apertures. Um, and so with more complete coverage of the disk, we can better constrain uh, parameters associated with the disk, like the position angle and the inclination angle, which has an impact on the inferred black hole mass. So the first ever black hole mass measurement made using CO emission was done with this radio facility PARMA. And in this case, the black hole sphere of influence was just barely resolved, even though this galaxy is very close by. And this observation required tens of hours to complete. Since then, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA, has provided this huge step up in terms of sensitivity and angular resolution compared to the previous radio facilities. So we can now routinely map molecular gas within the black hole sphere of influence of many nearby galaxies and really get the precision black hole masses needed to advance the field. There's been this huge uptick in the number of ALMA-based black hole mass measurements over the past few years. And now the number of molecular gas dynamical masses is about equal to the ionized gas dynamical masses that were done over you know, the past two decades. So ALMA is able to probe both the low and the high mass black holes and sample across many different galaxy types. So I've been part of a collaboration that has been using ALMA to carry out these kind of black hole mass measurements. So we're attaining ALMA observations of early type galaxies at the upper end of the black hole mass galaxy relations. And we're looking at galaxies that have dust disks in HST images. So such dust morphology suggests the presence of cleanly rotating molecular gas disks. Um, so our programs combined with some programs in the archive um, really kind of just show that there are a number of promising targets for this kind of work. And so here are just some examples of that. Um, so these are maps of the CO flux distribution, and then these are the radial velocity maps. So there are plenty of targets out there for us to apply this method to, and it really just highlights the opportunity afforded by ALMA to take an accurate census of uh, black holes, at least in early type galaxies that I'm showing here. Okay, so this is a really beautiful measurement that showcases ALMA's potential. Uh, so NGC 3258 is a nearby elliptical galaxy, 
And in cycle two, we got ALMA observations at 0.4 arc second resolution. Um, and so what you're seeing here is what we call a position velocity diagram. And so what you can see is that there's a lot of uh, high velocity emission here near the center. Um, and this, this feature here are Keplerian upturns. So that suggests the presence of a black hole. But these Keplerian upturns are not that well resolved. So we went back in a future cycle, in cycle four, and we got 0.1 arc second resolution observations. And now you can see these Keplerian upturns are really, really clear. We have really resolved the black hole sphere of influence. And so this is really an impressive position velocity diagram if you're not used to looking at these things. Um, so yeah, we fit rotating disk models to the cycle four AMA observations. And we find a black hole mass of 2.2 times 10 to the nine solar masses with an estimated uh, statistical uncertainty of just 0.2%, an estimated systematic uncertainty of about 0.6%, and then there's a 12% uncertainty due to the distance. Uh, so this is the most precise black hole mass measurement made for an early type galaxy, and it rivals some of the maser measurements that have been made for spiral galaxies. Okay, so earlier I discussed a sample of nearby compact galaxies that resemble the redshift two red nuggets and that have overmassive black holes. So besides determining stellar dynamical masses, we are also pursuing molecular gas dynamical masses with ALMA. Um, and so uh, we have identified eight of the compact galaxies that host these regular dust disks that you're seeing here in HST images. Um, NGC 1277 is not shown here, but that is also part of the sample. Um, so all the galaxies that you're seeing here have never been previously shown or, sorry, observed uh, with any kind of millimeter or submillimeter facility. And so we don't know what to expect for how bright the CO will be on these small scales. Therefore, what we did is observe just three of these galaxies at uh, somewhat moderate resolution, 0.2 arc second resolution. Um, and that would just resolve the expected black hole sphere of influence if these galaxies follow M sigma. So really we were testing for the presence of CO at the nucleus. Um, and we indeed found that there were regularly rotating molecular gas disks in those observations for all three galaxies. And so we finished the dynamical modeling of UGC 2698. Um, so for these models, what we do is we assume that, again, we have this thin disk of gas in circular rotation. At each radius in the disk, we determine the circular velocity uh, relative to the systemic velocity based on the enclosed mass, which depends on the black hole and the extended stellar mass distribution. The model velocity field is generated on a subsample pixel grid and projected onto the plane of the sky for value of inclination. Uh, the intrinsic line profiles are assumed to be Gaussian, and we center each of those line profiles on the projected line of sight velocity at each point on the model grid, and we give the line profiles some intrinsic width. Uh, we re bend down to the native pixel scale and we account for beam smearing, um, and that gives us a model cube. So we directly compare that model cube to the observed data cube, and we look for the best combination of parameters. Um, so everything I just described here and the results that I'll present next are assuming this uh, thin flat disk for the gas. Uh, we're also updating our code to allow for a possible warp disk for the future. Um, okay, so this is the corner plot for UGC 2698, and we're finding a black hole mass 2.5 times 10 to the nine solar masses. So we varied some of the inputs and the assumptions in our models uh, and built that into our error budget that's coded here. Um, and then this is just the comparison between the observed flux, velocity and velocity aspersion, and then our best fit model shown on the same scale. So it turns out that UGC 2698 is consistent with both the M sigma and ML relationships. Uh, so this is in contrast to the four other compact galaxies that we have stellar dynamical measurements for that lie above the ML relationship. Um, so UGC 2698 is actually the largest galaxy of the sample. It's the largest in terms of its effective radius and the largest in terms of its stellar mass. So it is still possible that these compact galaxies are relics of the redshift two red nuggets and uh, suggest that black hole growth precedes that of the host galaxy. In that case though, um, the other galaxies, for example, NGC 1277, would be more pristine relics of the redshift two red nuggets. Uh, whereas UGC 2698 may represent more of an intermediate stage of evolution. 
Um, so UGC 2698 may have undergone more mergers to bring it in line with the black hole scaling relations. Uh, that being said, again, it, we could just need more points at the upper end of the black hole mass distribution here. Um, so there could be more scatter in the relation at the upper end than we currently think. Uh, so it'll definitely be interesting to see where the other compact galaxies fall on this relation once we have black hole mass measurements for them. Um, in order to really get a handle at the scatter, we do need more black hole mass measurements in this regime, but we also need to directly compare independent mass measurement methods within the same galaxy. So the stellar and gas dynamical black hole mass measurement methods suffer from several but different systematic effects. And so it's really important to directly compare the two. Um, and unfortunately, that has been attempted on a small number of galaxies with mixed results. Um, so we definitely need more kind of studies like that before we can draw conclusions regarding the consensus, the consistency of the two methods and the subsequent effects on the black hole scaling relations. So on that note, I want to end with briefly talking about such a uh, comparison study that we are going to be doing with the James Webb Space Telescope in cycle one. So I'm leading a program to study the very famous elliptical galaxy M87. So M87 has actually been the subject of a number of black hole mass measurements over the years using both stellar and gas dynamical modeling methods. Uh, and this is even beginning as early as the late you know, 1970s. Um, so over the years, both the stellar and gas dynamical modeling methods, um, the actual modeling has improved. Of course, the data has improved significantly as well. But the most recent stellar and gas dynamical modeling methods continue to disagree by a factor of two. Um, we, of course, now have this image from the Event Horizon Telescope. So that provides us with a third independent measurement of the black hole mass. So at face value, it is uh, very reassuring that this EHT result uh, matches the stellar dynamical modeling result that provides a key validation of the stellar dynamical modeling technique. Uh, but it's also important to scrutinize this uh, agreement further only, both, only because both me measurements relied on these extensive uh, models, numerical models, with all of these built-in simplifying assumptions. So the most recent stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement was done by fitting axisymmetric orbit-based models and using AO-assisted Gemini NIFS observations. So the work certainly used state-of-the-art models and the best stellar kinematics available at the time, uh, but we can do a little bit better with JWST. Uh, so for example, these are the, some examples of the NIFS uh, kinematics near the center. So within about 0.3 arc seconds, uh, the active galactic nucleus, the AGN, uh, just kind of dominates the light. So the stellar absorption features are diluted here. And so you can't actually make uh, kinematic measurements at the center. Uh, so over here is the plot showing the best fit uh, stellar dynamical model. So that's the solid line. And then all the points are the actual observations of the stellar velocity dispersion. Uh, so at the center, no kinematic measurements could be made because of the AGN. And as you can see, this model here is unconstrained and it actually drops down. Um, so with JWST and it's very stable diffraction limited PSF, it's enhanced sensitivity and reduced background, we'll be able to make some more measurements within the shaded region here. We are also gonna combine our JWST observations with large scale IFU observations that we have already obtained with KCWI. And we're going to apply a trioxial orbit-based modeling approach for this galaxy. Um, we'll also kind of uh, examine other potential systematic effects, like putting a possible mass-to-light ratio gradient in our models. Um, and yeah, so with this work, uh, JWST really just provides us with this exciting and timely opportunity to obtain the most robust stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement for this galaxy. Um, and, you know, this is very much a key anchor to the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. Okay, so to summarize here, the local black hole mass census is highly incomplete. Uh, we still don't know exactly what roles black holes play in galaxy evolution. So we need more robust black hole mass measurements, especially at the extremes of the black hole mass scale and over a wider range of galaxies that have different evolutionary histories. So recent progress has been made with AO on large round based telescopes, these new uh, highly sensitive wide field IFUs, updates to the modeling methods, ALMA and now JWST. 
Uh, so with AO and Gemini, we're carrying out this large black hole mass measurement program aimed at addressing a bias in the kinds of galaxies for which black hole mass measurements have been made. Uh, with these wide field, highly sensitive IFUs, we are searching for the most massive black holes out there uh, with masses larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, with these triaxial orbit-based models and our new parameter search schemes, we're modeling early type galaxies in the massive survey. Um, and we'll also get uh, individual measurements of the intrinsic shape of these galaxies and be able to infer their assembly histories. Uh, with ALMA, we're measuring black hole masses in early type galaxies at the high mass end, including an interesting sample of compact galaxies that could be relics of the redshift two red nuggets and therefore tell us how black holes and galaxies grow over time with each other. And then finally, with upcoming JWST observations, we'll be re-examining this very important object, M87, a key anchor for the upper end of the relation. So yeah, that's everything. Thank you. Great, thanks Janelle. Uh, there are time for some questions. And if you're on the Zoom, I'll be watching the chat. Maybe if you raise your hand, I can also call on you. So let's have right away in the back. Sure, yeah. Oh, dominant to the rest of the galaxy. Oh, sorry. Uh, so for everyone on Zoom, uh, the question was about the black hole sphere of influence. Um, I said that this black hole sphere of influence uh, was the region where the gravitational potential from the black hole dominates. And so the question is, dominates over what? Uh, and so the answer is, dominates over the potential from the rest of the galaxy. So the extended stellar mass distribution, the dark matter halo. Um, so this is where the black hole is the most important and is mostly causing, say, the stars to move around. Yeah, um, so do you mean for the black hole mass? Like, what's the purpose? Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, being able to resolve the black hole sphere of influence, um, that definitely impacts uh, our ability to really constrain the black hole mass and how well we can constrain the black hole mass. Uh, so basically, uh, if you're not doing a great job of resolving the sphere of influence, there's a lot of degeneracies between like how much mass you assign to the black hole and how much mass you assign to the stars because in all of this, we're only measuring enclosed mass. Uh, but if you're able to you know, really, really resolve that region where the potential from the black hole is dominating, then you're gonna be most sensitive to the black hole and it's easier to separate and break that degeneracy. Um, so that's why you know, these high angular resolution observations are needed so we can really kind of probe that, that region. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the brief, the briefer summary uh, of that question uh, was. Uh, Rob was noting how um, in a few different cases, it looks like that the stellar dynamical black hole mass measurements tend to be higher than the gas dynamical black hole mass measurements. Uh, so he's wondering if that is something real, like is that a real systematic uh, in the mass measurement methods that we are seeing here? Um, or is it something where we have maybe preferentially targeted um, you know, these galaxies with these gas disks and maybe there's something there that you know, it's kind of our selection uh, that's causing this. Um, and well, I would say, well, one, we don't really know, but I would actually say it's probably the former rather than the, the latter. Um, so, you know, with these um, galaxies that we're studying with ALMA, you know, we happen to be studying early type galaxies, but really these gas disks exist like across the Hubble sequence. So there's not any particular galaxy property that we're seeing that is really standing out as like only those kind of galaxies have these gas disks. Um, so that's why I don't think it's that, but I mean, I, it could be. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting. We, like I said, we don't have many comparison studies between the stars and the gas. 
Uh, but when we do, and they just, you know, I think there's only maybe one or two that actually agree, everything else, the stellar dynamical measurement is always above the gas dynamical measurement. Um, so I do think there's something there, but I think what we need is just more numbers to see how to try to figure this out. Um, yeah. Seven is also the anchor, as you were saying. Yeah, M87 is definitely, it's, it's really frustrating because here we have this very nearby galaxy. It's so well studied, right? People have been looking at it since the 1970s and we can't figure this thing out. Like, you know, we still have this disagreement, um, but yeah. Questions? Oh, well, he's not doing it energetically, Darren. <laughs> Sure. Right, yes, yeah. Aaron's commenting that our own galaxy may show a similar offset between the stellar velocity dispersion. And, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. No. In fact, right, it's. Darren's <laughs> commenting that back in his day, these pictures were just one pixel. <laughs> I'm going to ask, uh, uh, to chair's prerogative or whatever I am today. Um, so you, know, you just talked about like you can only focus on the nearby galaxies because you need the resolution, the size, right, in the sphere of influence. Does GMT get you to other distances? I you just... uh, yes. Oh, yeah, I definitely don't have time yeah. to talk about it. Yeah, no, I'm so excited for GMT because... Uh, we can get to further distances uh, with GMT. And I think one of the things that I would love to do with GMT is more directly get at this question of, you know, what grows first? Do black holes, uh, you know, come before host galaxies? And so really what that boils down to is making black hole mass measurements um, at a bunch of different redshifts. So is there a redshift evolution in the black hole scaling relations? Um, so right now we can't do that whatsoever. We can't make black hole measurements like I'm talking about here with dynamics you know, at a redshift of even 0.5, right? So which EMT will be able to push to further distances and uh, hopefully be able to maybe say something about the evolution of the scaling relations. Yeah. One more question. Oh, sorry, Grisha. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so so when I say perhaps with these compact galaxies that the black hole comes first and the galaxy comes later, really I'm actually only talking about since a redshift of two because that's what these galaxies look like. Um, so I'm saying by a redshift of two, something has already happened where you have a black hole, you already have a galaxy and you have a black hole that is above the local relations that we see right now. Um, so yeah, I didn't talk about the whole beginning part of the picture. Um, so I, I'm not saying that there was a black hole and then magically, you know, a galaxy appeared around it. Um, but uh, I'm just saying since a redshift of two to now, it's more that the galaxy is growing more quickly than the black hole is growing. And then you end up on the relations that we see today, so. All right, well, we have reached the top of the hour. So I'm gonna suggest we thank Janelle again for her great talk. And you all have her email and know where her office is. You can track her down to talk about black hole masses more if you like. So thank you.